Netflix's One Day at a Time uh, aired its third and final season on Netflix this past year. Can it finally break into the Emmys race? I'm Tony Ruiz from Gold Derby here with the show's uh, executive producer, creator, writer, director, extraordinaire, Gloria Calderon Kellett. Um, Gloria, starting off, the question that I know you've probably been asked a, a whole lot uh, in recent months is what is the current status of the show? The current status is we are still waiting. Uh, we are hoping that we can find a home on a network or or a cable uh, service. We can't go to a streaming platform, so those are our options. And I think we're waiting to see how the pilots are coming in and if it makes sense for a network to uh, to put us on. We hope to find a new home, but uh, you know, we'll. I think we'll find out shortly. And and really, what has been the the? It it seems to me that the the outcry and the response from from not just you know critics and people in the industry, but fans of the show, uh, has really been extraordinary. You've had everybody you know retweeting and and these hashtags about saving one day at a time. Uh, I think even Lin Manuel Miranda is is big into this. What has all that meant to you? Oh my God! Well, shows are canceled every day, and nobody cares. So the fact that I've been on shows that have been canceled and nobody cares, the fact that uh, that we had this outcry speaks to the starvation of this community and and people who just appreciated uh, this type of storytelling. And so it means so much when fans care enough. Uh, and are outraged. I mean, my God, I, I, if you have to go out, that's the way to go out for sure. <laughs> so, so take us back to the beginning of, of, of the genesis of the show. Um, you know, how, what, what was the discussion like saying, okay, we're going to take this, this show from the, from the seventies and early eighties and remake it with a Cuban American family. Um, and how did Norman Lear come on board? What, how did that strange <laughs> alchemy all come together? <laughs> well, it all started before me. So the wonderful Brent Miller, who is a producer that works with Norman, he had actually um, been speaking to agencies about a, uh, a study that was done by Coca-Cola about emerging markets and how the single Latina mother was the most uh, the most prominent coming up that was not being spoken to or marketed to. And he thought, oh my gosh, here we have in Norman's library, because they were looking at his library and looking to see if there was anything they could revitalize from his library. There's a famous show about, you know, Norman put the first single married woman on television who had the audacity to divorce her husband. Uh, that was only 43 years ago, and uh, that was the first time a divorced woman uh, was on television as the leading character. So it was really groundbreaking. So it was really Brent's idea to revitalize this. And so Brent went to Norman, who got excited, and uh, they brought on Mike Royce because they were big Everybody Loves Raymond fans. And, of course, Mike also did Enlisted and, and uh, uh, Men of a Certain Age. And... He came on board, and I think these three white guys sat in a room and thought, oh, well, we're, if we're going to do a Latino show, we should probably get somebody in here who can speak to that uh, point of view. And they took uh, some meetings, and I was one of the meetings. And when I met with Norman, it was it was really love at first sight. And we got on so beautifully, and, and by the time that meeting ended, he said, well, you're my girl. And I got to my car and called my agents. So I'm like, am I making a show with Norman Lear? What's happening? <laughs> And it all kind of came together from there. Mike and I sat down shortly thereafter. We clicked immediately as, as creators. He made very clear that this was going to be a true partnership and he was going to teach me how to be a showrunner and guide me and support me. And he did every step of the way. And so this incredible collaboration came together with Norman and Mike and I, but it really started with them. I was the last piece of the puzzle. So, uh, my, when I was in my meeting with Norman, I spoke about my family and I talked about my mom and he was like, explain your mom to me. And I said, imagine Rita Moreno, uh, but, but with, you know, short brown hair. And, and uh, he said, I'm friends with Rita. I'm like, of course you are. Uh, and, and it really all kind of came together very quickly. Once we had Rita attached, you know, Mike and I went off and wrote it and, uh, and pitched it to Netflix and they, they bought it and, and it, we were off to the races. And it was uh, such an incredible experience to get to tell the story, but also have the creative freedom that Netflix allowed us 
to do it without a bunch of cooks getting in the kitchen and messing it up. And I think that's the authenticity that the fans really responded to is they really saw not just the Latinx audience, but I think a lot of community immigrant communities and, and a bunch of really white people who were like, I see my friend or my neighbor in these characters, they feel familiar and, and honest. And uh, that that's all thanks to the collaboration that I had with Mike and Norman and then Netflix allowing us to, to make the show we wanted to make. Well, and, and it seems like the show just really has kind of, you know, grown and particularly in this third season, you started to see, you know, different facets of these characters that you hadn't seen before. Um, and so, you know, some, some highlights, like for example, the anxiety episode uh, with, the, with the black and white images of Penelope, you know, having her anxiety attacks. Uh, where did that idea come from? Because that seems to be something that you don't get to see a lot of mental health issues on television unless it's treated as like a, like a, you know, a huge, gigantic, over melodramatic thing, whereas this puts it into both a comic light and a real light. How did that episode come about? Well, we had done uh, really at the beginning of the, the, the first, the pilot episode, the first episode, uh, we made mention of her PTS and medication. So that was something that was sort of threaded throughout. And and then in season two, we had the Hello Penelope episode, which was such an incredible tour de force that Justina gave about going off of her medication. And so this seemed like uh, in all of our work with mental health specialists and in talking about this, this is something that a pill doesn't cure. You know, it's not like this is something that's ongoing. And so we really wanted to honor, same with the LGBTQ stories, we wanted to honor the ongoing uh, challenges, but the attainable ongoing challenges <clears throat> of presenting uh, someone with mental health issues and how she's constantly having to reevaluate, come to terms with, and deal with that during a very busy, funny, wild, big life. And so it seemed like explaining to people what an anxiety attack was to this character and then framing it in this is something that also runs in families. This is also something that maybe your kid or your friend or your mother has. Explaining it and then modeling behavior so that people who don't know anything about it can maybe get a glimpse into what that looks like and understand a family member a little bit more and maybe learn ways to help the loved ones that they have around them because this is a really, you know, we've learned it's so much more common than people talk about. So that's really where that came from is wanting to try to play out what an anxiety attack looked like in the mind of, of, of the person surviving through it and have a language with which to have conversations of what you can do if you are a, a standing by how you can help your loved one. And that's how that episode came together. But it was a, it was a tricky one and we're, we're so proud with how it turned out. We feel like the black and white, which didn't come in until the editing room, actually. Really? Yeah. We, that's what we, we said, we need another little thing. You know, we need something else to deliver this uh, information. And, and we knew that it was going to be something in editing and the black and white is what came out of it. And we, we feel like that really nailed what we were going for. It's very interesting too, because oftentimes in anxiety uh, situations, I, I've had that myself, is, is seeing things in a very black and white sort of way. So on one hand, it almost seems, seems like, Obvious. So it's, it's actually interesting to hear that it didn't come in until later. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another another really key storyline I thought for this season was uh, the uh, was Schneider falling off the wagon. Um, you know, we've always we've heard about his past in the previous two seasons. Uh, when did you guys decide that this season was going to be when you were going to tackle it? Really, we thought about it as soon as we started season three because we we'd sort of built the first two seasons towards a very large final episode, very emotional episode. And after season two with Lydia almost dying, we were like, well, we can't do that. I mean, we can't do that again. Uh, but what is a life or death thing that isn't life or death, but is the life or death of an experience. And we thought, well, here we have a character that again, since season one, since the pilot episode, we've known that Schneider was in recovery and dealing with that and doing his steps. And, it's something we have that's been so interwoven in the fabric of the show. And that's what's the beauty about getting to make several seasons of something is you get to deep, do, do deep dives into characters that sometimes, you know, Todd has been such a clutch player coming in and being comedic. 
uh, but to be able to really allow the audience to see what a vibrant and incredible actor he is uh, and allow him to to go to that place. And so uh, Todd, you know, ha, ha, has been very open about his own issues of um, recovery. And he came in and spoke to the room about things. And we asked if, if it was all right, if we could use some of that. And he was incredibly generous in allowing us to to run with uh, some of his own actual stories. And so uh, we decided to take Schneider on this journey. And it was also a real journey for Alex, um, seeing Alex become a man and what that looked like with him uh, experimenting with drugs at the beginning of the season. <clears throat> and then seeing that his own father has addiction issues and his mother has anxiety issues and that this is something he should maybe look at. It was a really important a thing to thread for both of those male characters because we spent a lot of time talking about the women on the show and delving into the lives of the women and it was really a gift to be able to jump in with Todd and with Marcel uh, and that scene in the laundry room which I had the great privilege of directing uh, was just a tour de force for both of those actors to see them commit in a comedy doing a very uh, dramatic scene so uh, it was we knew we were going to do it at the beginning and then and then we were really happy with the way that turned out and it's interesting you say that because talking about you know doing drama in the midst of comedy, you know, in in so many lesser shows, the the drama is is hammered over your head. Whereas with this show, it never feels like a very special episode. Like we're like this is going to be that episode and that moment. How do you and the writers? How do you work with the writers to to keep the comedy woven and still be as real as you manage to be? It's so hard. It's so hard. Uh, it really is. I mean, I think with comedy, people think it's it's easy, and it's so hard to dance that dance. It's really guttural. We really have to feel it out. It's why run throughs. You know, our show works like a play. We see it every day on its feet until we shoot it. So it's a week of workshopping it and seeing it in its entirety and feeling it out and saying like, oh, is it too heavy here? Do we need a joke? Sometimes it's really fighting the urge to have a joke in a moment where normally the sitcom would have a joke here to, tr to cut the treacle, the treacle cutter. And it's saying, no, we don't need a joke here. This needs to just sit and that's okay. And uh, that's been one of the great joys of being on Netflix as well as we have a little bit more time to do that. We, you know, our episodes are about 26 to 28 minutes as opposed to 20 minutes on a, on a standard network. So uh, all of that is just gut. It's just feeling it out and then having the consensus of the room of this, these wonderful brain trust of writers to, to say, what do we feel? And, and that's how we determine uh, what ends up happening. And was the show always intended to be shot in front of a studio audience? You know, you see the multi-camera sitcom kind of falling out of fashion dumbly, I might add. Um, but when it's done right, it, was it always going to be multi-camera? Oh. Always going to be multi-cam, always. It was the kind of storytelling that Mike Royce and I both loved. We both love the theatrical aspect. We both love the audience. The audience keeps you honest. Doing a show in front of an audience every week keeps you honest. And it keeps us on our toes. And it makes sure that we are relevant in a way that when you are shooting alone, it just is different. It's, they, the audience provides a role, an important role for us. And we wanted to do the throwback thing and try to... Mm, bring something new to something that is traditionally an old school format. And Norman was, you know, basically invented TV with this format. He did very dramatic episodes. I mean, the mod abortion episode and, you know, uh, uh, a rape episode with Edith. And, you know, like he was able to really use this very um, everyday re relatable format of a multicam to get into the homes and tell really real stories. And so that challenge was too delicious to not attempt. And of course, then we were terrified that we were gonna ruin Norman Lear's legacy, but turns out he's very happy with how the show turned out. <laughs> well, he's still, and, he, and he's, he's very much involved. He's, he's been very much involved with the show. Tell me about how he, what his contribution to this uh, incarnation has been. You know, in season one, it, he was much more hands-on. And then he, to his credit, really allowed us, I mean, he's at every run through, he's at every show, he warms up the audience. It's unbelievable. I think everyone gets this treat of having him come out and, and speak to them and having their lives changed by, uh, by a moment with Norman. Uh, but he really is just our greatest champion. More than anything, he just, uh, 
uh, has such love and support and is delighted, like truly like a kid delighted at every table read to see it all come to life. And, and he just has such a joy and love of storytelling and of telling stories of other. It's just been his life's work and it hasn't stopped, which is really encouraging for the rest of us. Well, we can't talk about, you know, all your roles behind the scenes without talking about the fact that this season you showed up in front of the camera um, <laughs> in, in a little arc playing uh, Penelope's uh, ex-husband's uh, fiance, now wife. Was that a, originally the idea? And, and how did that whole thing come about? Well, I wanted to do a part on the show. I didn't know what it was going to be. And then- it, And you are the boss, so you can- I know, your I know, I know. I could have, yes. So it needed to be the right thing. And it also needed to be at a time of the season where me not being in the room uh, would not be a hindrance. So it needed to be near the end of the season. Uh, and at first we were talking about like maybe Schneider dates somebody who looks exactly like Penelope and they were like, oh my God, and then Gloria could play it. I mean, the room is really supportive, thankfully. I mean, they have to be, I guess I'm their boss. But they were like, oh, it'd be really funny. So it was that for a minute. And then I was like, oh my gosh, what if Victor gets remarried? And it's like, he basically is marrying Penelope. And, you know, Justina and I, everywhere we go, people always think we're sisters or cousins. Uh, it's no surprise that she's playing me on the show because we are uh, we, we are separated at birth, essentially. And then once that wig came on, it was insane. It was people on set were losing their minds. And then, of course, because I was directing the final episode, there was then a third me running around that was my stand-in for scenes that I needed to be in front of the, in front of the monitors for. So yeah, at one point my dad went up to the, the stand-in and thought it was me. It was just mad. And then everyone was thinking I was Justina and it was hilarious. It was just a comedy of errors. We had a noises off scenario, uh, but it was so great and so fun to do. And I just loved getting to sit across. I mean, I did a scene with, with Rita Moreno and Justina Machado and I'm sitting in the middle of it going, I can't believe this is my life right now. It was amazing. So, you know, in this, in this time that we're in, it, fe it feels like we need more shows like one day at a time, not less. What, what is it about a, a show? What is it about this show that you think just resonates with so many people the way that it does? I think it's a show ultimately about love. I think it's a show that is earnest and kind and, trying to, it's a show about building bridges, really, in a time when we are really building walls. And so it's tricky to be making something that is earnest uh, because I think there is a trend towards cynical, cool kind of stuff. And multi-cams are also not the sexiest, certainly when it comes to awards. Uh, you know, it's historically multi-cams find it difficult to break through. Um, the cool kids of, uh, of the single cam. But I agree that this type of storytelling is really important. It's always going to be important to me. And I've seen through the outreach on Twitter what that type of storytelling has meant to the LGBTQ community, to the veteran community, to the Latinx community, and to communities of color, period, who are feeling themselves seen through the Alvarez family. So I really do hope that there are more shows like this because I do also agree that they're important. But, you know, Netflix has been a wonderful partner uh, for us, but in terms of marketing and putting the show up for awards, it's been very tricky for us to, to break through. So things like this, we're so grateful to always talk to, to the tastemakers, uh, to let people know that we exist, uh, because I think it is vital so that more of us can exist in the future. Well, Gloria Calderon uh, Kellett, thank you so much. Uh, best of luck, hoping that you break through this year at the Emmys. Uh, everyone, be sure to hit like and subscribe so that you can hear more uh, interviews with the tastemakers and go to goldlitterby.com to make your predictions. Gloria, thank you so much. Thank you.